Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the MDPI Sustainability Foundation Awards Ceremony. I'm Lillian from the uh, Scientific Officers Board and I'm also the Sustainability Specialist at MDPI. And I'll be your host today. I'll also guide you through the celebration of outstanding achievements uh, towards a more sustainable future. I'm honored to present these awards because throughout my academic career, I have been involved in projects that were rooted in sustainability, and I understand the challenges uh, we face in implementing more sustainable technologies. Sustainability has uh, been present in MDPI from the very beginning. Uh, the initial focus of the MDPI Sustainability Foundation was the preservation of chemical compounds. Uh, which were developed during research projects, but then often forgotten after these projects were over and the research was published. The samples uh, would then be made available to the scientific community for future research. In the future, the Foundation hoped that, uh, hope to expand the preservation of the samples and also to uh, broaden it to other uh, resources. Now the main purpose of the foundation is to promote scientific dialogue. As part of this effort, MDPI has initiated the World Sustainability Awards and the Sustainability Foundation. MDPI is also committed to the promotion of the Sustainable Development Goals. And according to data from Insights, uh, last year about 80% of the content published uh, in the journals in our portfolio were classified within the scope of Sustainable Development Goals. We're also signatories of the Sustainable Development Goals Publishers Compact and also the United Nations Global Compact, to which we report every year on the achievements of the company regarding the topics of human and labor rights, the environment, and anti-corruption. So now, without further ado, let us begin the presentation of the awards to these outstanding individuals. Each of them has demonstrated exceptional skills, dedication, and commitment to making positive impact on not only their communities, but our society as a whole. We will start with the Emerging Sustainability Leader Award with Dr. Eugene Kim, and then we're going to have a presentation from Dr. Julia Lohmann and Dr. Barrett Kameranzat. Our jury is composed of Dr. Lela Melon and Annette Rejek Jambrak. <laughs> and they were decided on the order of the Emerging Sustainability Leader Awards Prize. That is from the finalists who will be for second and third places. Then we move to the presentations of the, uh, our Ds of the World Sustainability Awards. We start with Dr. Akriti Karant with the topic Living with Wildlife, Insights from 25 Years of Science, Conservation and Education in India. Then from Professor Thomas Leon with the presentation towards corporate sustainability, transparency, accountability and responsibility. And finally, with Professor Michael Templeton with the presentation Sustainability Sanitation for All. Thank you for coming here today and I hope you enjoy these presentations. Let's start with Yi Jun Kim. Good afternoon. I'm um, really honored to be the finalist of Emerging Sustainability Leader Award in this beautiful city, Basel. I will say I am a missionary of sustainability, and my mission is to promote the sustainability in the areas where the sustainability is not readily um, recognized or acknowledged, apparent. So I accomplished this mission by focusing on three pillars of sustainability, uh, specifically first pillar, environment by my wind energy research, and second pillar, education by my renewable energy education, and third, economic pillars with my climate tech business solutions for small or middle-sized companies. So the first pillar, environment, my research, has been tried to solve the limits of wind turbine efficiency. So I have employed the evolutionary algorithm, specifically genetic algorithm and computational fluid mechanics 
to produce some uh, shapes, like optimized L5 foil shapes, and the L4 is the critical design for wind turbine, wind turbine. And the research has showcased the enhanced aerodynamic performance of wind turbines, and the work was done in, at Institute of Fluid Mechanics, FAO Germany, and it was supported by Korean government project. So naturally, it fostered the German-Korean partnership of the research. So I have worked hard to make a connection between the researchers among two countries. And this work is aligned with sustainable, sustainable development goal number seven and 13. And second pillar is education. Um, by education, I truly want to address the global sustainability awareness disparities. So I, I love to teach the students from the nation with relatively lower ratio of renewable energy production and sustainability importance in their government policies. So I enhance and emphasize the importance of renewable energy and sustainability in my university lecture. I teach the subject like renewable energy and fuel cell technology or big data analysis with artificial intelligence for the environmental, um, environmental sectors. And I try to make those knowledge to be delivered to the students for the global energy transition to make them to be equipped with the skills and knowledge which are ap appropriate or fitted with both industrial revolution world. So I try to see um, the change of the students who were somehow not interested in sustainability. But as time goes on, I truly see they are getting more engaged in sustainability. And when they show the, uh, the true interest on renewable energy, it was so meaningful and I am still meaningful and I'm really loving this work. So this is aligned with sustainable development goal number four and SDG goal number 13. And third pillar is economics. I have ventured into the business world with establishing my own business. It's called EcoFluid. And um, this business specializes in consulting the companies who are producing sustainable products. And one noteworthy work is fluid flow visualization of the wind turbine shaped volume repeller. And I see it, that products have been replaced, the harmful chemical repellers. Uh, which was really harmful to the ecosystem of uh, Korean rural areas, South Korean rural areas. So, and I also see the products which were also already sold are subconsciously persuade the clients in the rural areas uh, to lead them to accept the social acceptance of wind turbine project in Korea. So it was also meaningful. And I also have participated in actively in one program, which was launched by venture capital company, so-called Sopung. And I took the position of technical fellow. And then I have researched really intensively for identifying some climate tech business sol solution or opportunity in uh, the market of Japan or Vietnam to find out some uh, business ideas and making some climate uh, client interview, etc., to provide some sustainable solution with economic impact. So all those efforts are also targeting SDG number 13. And let me introduce my upcoming project. The goal of this project is to infuse the concept of sustainability into real, into real estate markets, especially the market with lower concept or awareness of sustainability. I try to uncover the environmental potential of existing buildings because our market has relatively lower number of green buildings. But we try to, uh, me and my team try to use the state-of-the-art, uh, state-of-the-art art artificial intelligence and open big data, which is largely applicable and available in South Korean data based on our strong IT skills. So we, uh, we try to foster the environmental consciousness among building property owners uh, by visualizing the connection point between environmental uh, attributes or characteristic of the buildings and their economic values. So I work with the real estate company, which has 
for about $9 million annual value of transactions. So we truly hope that we can make an economic impact to the market with the message of sustainability. Um, of course, those uh, results and methodology can be applicable in uh, my university lecture, and also uh, it can be applicable for low carbon city research targeting SDG number 11. So I'm so happy to planning this project because it is a blend of using the three pillars of sustainability, education, and environment, and economics. So this is my global sustainability mission. In environment, I have networked the German and Korean researchers for boosting the wind energy research. And in education, I teach the students from Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Uzbekistan and Korea to promote them to be the future leader of the sustainability. And economically, I try to influence the Japan, Vietnam, and Korean market with establishing my own business, consulting the companies who are struggle to make the uh, sustainable products. And I work with uh, also venture capital company who are struggling to uh, make the bigger impact with SDG goal in our society and in our whole world. I truly believe our mission is possible if we all work together with true heart of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, so now uh, we can have uh, one question from the jury only, and then you have to move on. I, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate you on the presentation, but first and foremost on your hard work. Uh, one question. Do you think that outsourcing right now or starting to sell in Europe the same products that would specifically in agriculture prevent the pesticides being so much used, that that could work on a grander scale? Or, a better question, have you tried that and why not? Okay, actually, um, I discussed this topic with my partner. So <laughs> I my, my work was to make the flip through visualization of their product to validate them. So I asked them, do you have any mind to uh, make this export to Europe? And he said, of course, yes, then bring some information. So I will bring this information to him. Yeah, we plan. Thank you. So now we're going to have the presentation from Dr. Julia Lohmann. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my research and work here at the Sustainability Leader Award. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. And with my presentation, I want to show the relevance of sports and physical activity for sustainable development and give an overview about my research in this field. Sports and physical activity take place in different settings, as physical education in schools, as daily physical activity, as informally organized activities in leisure time, or as formally organized sports, including professional sports. Representative studies consistently show the relevance of sports in society in numbers. For example, in Germany, about a quarter of the population indicates special interest in sports. In 2019, 44% of the EU population practice some physical activities at least once a week. And physical education is a compulsory subject in all EU member states, where over 76 million pupils can be inspired about sustainability issues in sports and learn how to lead physically active and sustainable lifestyles. As a social subsystem, sports also mirrors society. That means that sport may contribute to sustainable development goals. For example, regular physical activity contributes to good health and well-being. Active mobility is a driver for good health, <clears throat> but also for climate uh, change, or it's good for climate change. Uh, <laughs> it's bad for climate change. <laughs> it, it contradicts climate change. And its promotion is, uh, may also lead to more sustainable cities and communities. Sports may also be a driver for social sustainability. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, for example, recognizes the contribution of sports to tolerance and respect and the contribution it makes to the empowerment of women and young people to education and social inclusion.
but sports may also compromise sustainable development, for example, regarding waste that is being produced during sport events or left behind in nature, compromising ecological sustainability and demonstrating irresponsible consumption patterns. Or sports-related travel with its emissions that further contribute to climate change. Sports is also a domain that repeatedly highlights and perpetuates social inequalities or human rights violations, as seen, for example, in the preparations to the FIFA World Cup in Qatar, or in the case of Iranian climber El Nas Rekabi, who participated in a competition without wearing a hijab and was placed under arrest afterwards. Although the benefits and problems of sports seem evident, the educational potential of sports in terms of dealing with the ambil uh, ambivalence of sports is still far from being exploited. And there is still a lack of fundamental research on the contribution of sports to sustainable development, for example, regarding interdisciplinary research on human nature interactions in sports. And that's where my research comes in. The first research trend I'd like to introduce deals with education for sustainable development in physical education. This is also the context where I started my professional sustainability journey in 2017, when I established a new course for future PE teachers where they experienced and learned about sustainability in outdoor sports using the example of rock climbing. Based on these experiences, we launched a larger project aiming at integrating the ESD concept into various courses within the PE teacher education program at my university and evaluating this implementation process as a research project. This project operated on various levels with the idea of considering the entire chain from PE teacher educators at the university to pupils in PE classes. In this project, for example, we developed a seminar on ESD using the example of football. Here, students acquired expertise in sustainable development within the context of football, and they used this knowledge to design a football-themed day centered around the theme Kick It Sustainably at a local school. On this day, pupils were dealing with fairness and equal opportunities during a football tournament, learning about responsible consumption of sports equipment, or developing ideas for sustainability in the local professional football club. Regarding the evaluation and research, we, started, <clears throat> we studied subjective theories of PE teacher educators regarding the concepts of sustainability and ESD as these are important precursors of if and how they implement ESD in their courses. We developed and published a theoretical framework on ESD-specific professional competences for PE teachers and empirically assessed certain aspects of this competence in student PE teachers. For example, their beliefs about sustainability issues in PE classes or their sport-specific sustainability knowledge. Additionally, we are on the way to publishing guidebooks and lesson plans, which other educators can also use for their own teaching. At this point, I'd like to move beyond the context of PE and provide a brief preview of further research endeavors that I am currently embarking on or planning. A proposal that we are currently working on focuses on promoting active mobility in the school context. Here, we aim to research the barriers and drivers of active mobility in the school context, and we will engage in a participatory process to develop and evaluate specific, setting-specific measures for promoting active mobility, leveraging expertise from science, the local community, and schools. The second endeavor is research about social and ecological issues in human nature interactions in outdoor sports. And this is already underway. We started with an initial study on sustainable behavior in outdoor sports, which is the first step in the application for funding for foundational research on human nature interactions and driving factors for sustainable behavior in outdoor sports. Based on these results, we want to develop digital and individualized educational and management measures aimed at promoting sustainable practices in outdoor sports together with relevant stakeholders. Last but not least, I would like to briefly outline a pathway 
through which our research in this field contributes to making the world of sport at least a bit more sustainable. To this end, we founded the Think Tank Sportainable about a year ago, a network of stakeholders from various science disciplines, sports associations, athletes, sport business, and infrastructure. Together, we strive to find answers to questions about how sports can be resource efficient, low in emissions, environmentally friendly, and socially responsible. To achieve this, we collaborate on various projects with different partners. For instance, we develop and revise sustainability guidelines together with the German Football League, quite a big player in sports, or explore ways to promote sustainable development in sports clubs through sponsorships. I will now come to the end of my presentation and instead of summarizing, just say thanks to all these people and thank you for listening and thanks again for giving me the opportunity to present my work here at the World Sustainability Forum. Thank you, Dr. Lohmann. Uh, now we can have one question from the jury. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how to not do this, so I'm sorry also to <laughs> Professor Lohmann. Um, thank you very much. This is super interesting. Um, I love the fact how you related the SDGs across in the sense of, okay, climate action, okay, if we move more, we think more, but we need to be sustainable while doing it. So it's beautiful. It's this holistic way of seeing things. Now, because of everything that I've seen, this very much sounds as a transformation, transition, empowerment, and educating any sector mm -hmm. of our economy, to be completely frank. Mm -hmm. So my question now would be, did you drive inspiration from observing any other sectors too, in the sense of what is unsustainable? Or did you focus in your thinking and creating this mind map and creating the knowledge base just on sports? Um, well, I'm, I'm quite focusing on sports and, and then the sports sector includes so many other sectors. So for example, the textile industry, this spans uh, over our daily lives, but then also goes into the sports sector or a food industry. Um, we've heard some uh, presentations today about sustainability in the food industry, and I think they, they are probably uh, quite some steps further. Um, but then still food also plays a role in sports. And um, my uh, focus is on the educational aspects and on social science research uh, in the sports sector, and that's my contribution to it. And when it comes to social ecological research, for example, then I uh, cooperate with colleagues who are ecologists, who know their business about ecological research, or at, uh, in the think tank, we also have specialists in material sciences. So if we have a project there, then I would use their expertise and uh, bring into my expertise to do real interdisciplinary projects and research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, finally, you're going to hear from uh, Dr. Bacharet Kamranzad. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Bahare Kamranzad, and I'm from the University of uh, Strathclyde uh, in Scotland. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this event, and I'm very honored to be invited to present my research on sustainability of ocean renewable energy in a changing climate. Um, first of all, just a quick introduction to myself. I'm currently, as I mentioned, working at the University of Strathclyde, but before that I've been working in Japan, Kyoto University, for six years, initially as a postdoc and then as, as an assistant professor, and before that I was working at the Iranian National Institute for Oceanography and Atmospheric Science. In Strathclyde, we have been able to um, establish, co-establish um, Strathclyde Center for Doctoral Training in AI-based ocean forecast for marine operation. I'm currently the head of coastal engineering and ocean climate research group. And we have actually also established international integrated wave energy research group, which connects researchers working on wave energy subjects all around the world. And I'm also currently in editorial board of JMSC and a guest editor for ocean engineering and applied ocean research. My research areas covered climate change impact, sustainability of ocean renewable energies, extreme events, and uh, coast, coastal protection and resilience, and also numerical soft uh, computing methods and hybrid methods. So we all know about the energy crisis and climate change impacts. So the governments and the countries have committed to net zero emissions. 
and set some targets to, to meet that. And we know about the importance of renewable energies as a measure to tackle the uh, impacts or negative impacts of uh, climate change. But at the same time, we know that about 40% of the world's population are living within 100 kilometers of a coastline. So ocean renewable energies could be a good measure to uh, tackle the negative impacts of climate change. But there's a problem with ocean renewable energy, and, that, uh, and that's it, that, that problem is that they are actually affected by climate change. So we use them to tackle the impact of climate change, but the climate change will also affect the available resources. Another issue is that more than 10% of the world's population lives in coastal areas which are less than 100 meters above the sea level. So there is a risk of coastal disasters, which here we just consider flooding and erosion because tsunami is not something we actually can control. So, um, and the, imp the climate change is affecting that as well. But how we can solve this problem? The climate change impact on our coastal areas with such large population is very complex. The climate change impact will affect on the average climate, the average ocean climate, atmospheric and ocean climate, and also it, uh, it causes sea level rise and also change in extreme conditions. For example, we have like more intense or more frequent typhoons or cyclones. So the first one, changing average ocean climate, will cause changing ocean renewable energies, as I mentioned. And interestingly, installation of this ocean renewable energy, for example, wind farms, wave farms, will also interact with the coastal area. So they will cause coastal accretion or erosion because they absorb part of the energy that goes from the ocean to the land. And changing average ocean climate itself will accelerate the coastal erosion as well. Sea level rise will cause flooding and also will uh, affect the coastal erosion. These are all chronic impacts of uh, uh, climate change impact on um, coastal erosion. But changing extreme, as well as causing flooding, it also causes acute coastal erosion. So it's very important to consider various aspects of climate change on our coastal areas and consider the combined impact of all these parameters on our coastal areas. So how this type of research will impact on human life and environmental health? Well, it's related to renewable energy, so economic growth by uh, creating and providing more clean energy, by creating protected and resilient coastal areas, um, or it, as, as it's called, a sustainable satoumi. Satoumi is the Japanese term for the coastal area which is affected by human activities there. And also preserve and restore critical coastal ecosystems uh, to create a sustainable coastal landscape. So uniqueness and innovation of this type of research is that it connects three different areas of climate change, ocean renewable energy, and coastal protection. So we can actually use the ocean renewable energy for coastal protection, because as I mentioned, they absorb part of the energy and then convert it to electricity. That means the coastal area behind them, for example, behind the wind farms or behind the wave farms or different types of ocean renewable energy are more protected against the uh, impacts of climate change. So with this, one of the novelties that we can um, associate with this type of research is that we can propose novel criteria for redefining the suitable areas for capturing the energy from the ocean, waves or winds or uh, other resources. And also we can use them as a, as a combined uh, measure, for example, co-locating wind and wave or wind and wave and solar, um, and also multi-purpose, as I mentioned, we can use the wave farm for coastal protection. So there are three type of, types of novelty associated with this research. Plus, we can also replace some existing numerical models with artificial intelligence, which make them more efficient. Plus, we can also use the results for socioeconomic and environmental impact assessments. 
So impacts on three pillars of sustainability, environment, economic, and social. This research has different impacts. For example, for the environmental, we can achieve net zero uh, emission targets, as I mentioned, and we can enhance the resilience or uh, protection of the coastal areas, and we can create a sustainable marine environment, not only for, human, uh, for humans, but also for any type of species that live in the marine environment. And also biodiversity preservation for the economic, it has a lot of like impacts. For example, some of them energy cost saving, innovation and tech development, of course, job creation and boosting the local economies. Many people these days are moving from coastal areas to more inland because of this uh, condition there, because of the erosion or any, any uh, other problems. But we creating job and even maybe, maybe enhancing the tourism in coastal areas, we may be able to help the, the, co the local economies. <coughs> Sorry, economy. And also infrastructure development, attracting more investment to our coastal areas and export opportunities, enhanced fisheries and marine activities. And when it comes to social impacts, we have improved quality of life for those who live in the, in the coastal areas. We have uh, enhanced public trust. Okay, if you have more income, if you have more sustainability on our coastal areas, then we will gain more trust and inclusivity and equity, while creating more jobs and providing equal opportunities for people living in the coastal area with cultural and heritage preservation. For example, in a country like Scotland, we have a lot of like cultural heritage very close to the coast, and it's our responsibility to, to um, protect them. And also, um, last but not least, education and awareness. So this research mainly aligns with four areas of sustainable development goals. Number seven, uh, in, um, affordable and clean energy, of course, because it's related to renewable energy. And number 11, sustainable cities. Number 13, climate action. And number 14, life below water. It could also relate to uh, life on land. And about the geographical impact of this research, we have been working and applying this research, the combination of three areas of climate change, sustainable um, ocean renewable energy, and coastal protection in various areas from global scale to regional scale to local scales. For example, the left figure shows the areas we detected as the new suitable locations for capturing energy from the ocean waves considering the impact of changing climate. The second one is the seasonal change of wave power in the Indian Ocean, and the last one is the same for Japan. So this research can apply for different, uh, in different areas, uh, so we need, to, we need to develop new uh, methodologies for uh, generating high-resolution data, for example, accurate data in each region. And that's all, that's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we can have one question from the jury. <laughs> I am not letting this slide without a question. Uh, thank you very much. I really much enjoyed it. It's a super important topic. I don't think we're aware of uh, what kind of an ally or an enemy the sea can be due to everything we've done. Um, so I would just have kind of this consideration slash question. Mm, so you're absolutely right, and I was just nodding here <laughs> like the biggest fan when you said we don't know. There's so much uncertainty here of how climate change is going to impact the sea that this is a field of research that is very dangerous, inherently dangerous, because of the uncertainty. And we're all dealing with uncertainty. It's driving us insane. But there is exceptionally a lot of uncertainty in coastal areas due to everything that is happening, right? And the second thing that makes me uncertain for these solutions in general and trying to figure out the flows and the waves and what are we doing um, is the pollution in terms of sea and how we're going to be cleaning that up because technology needs to enter there too and specifically now in coastal areas also because we are using that water for whichever means even if just for fishing so did you consider those two things of how high the uncertainty for instance is of what is going to happen and how to make this compatible with the fact that we need to 
clean our oceans before we can actually create structures that are long lasting and serving us because at the end this is for serving humanity nothing else so that would be all yeah thank you, thank you. absolutely that, that was a really great point especially for like uh, the, the first part of uh, your question uh, of course we have a lot of like uncertainties when it comes to the ocean because Obviously, we can't we can't have that much of measurements compared to inland, and it's more much more uh, expensive to do any operation inside the ocean than inland. And for the second question, um, yes, absolutely, ocean pollution will at least we can we can say change the density of the water, which affects the, all the estimations about the renewable energies, ocean renewable energies. That's the least. There are other options. For example, we have marine heat waves, which also affect the the, 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 the condition even in the coastal areas. So the impact is really uh, vast, and uh, we have to consider the various aspects of this kind of like impacts, climate change impacts, as I mentioned. So in this research, I did not consider the impact of, for example, marine or pollution or marine uh, heat waves, or the, because that makes it more, even more complicated. But that's absolutely necessary to consider as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Those are very interesting and very different presentations. So now we're going to move on to the Road uh, Sustainability Awards. And I'm going to invite here now for the presentation, Dr. Kriti. Uh, and uh, Kriti Current and your uh, presentation on living with wildlife insights uh, from 25 years of science, conservation, and education in India. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So I had an extraordinary childhood, I think, and a jump start on being a scientist. I saw my first tiger when I was a year old. And by the time I was eight, I was setting camera traps. I was kind of looking at how different leopards and tiger poop and scat uh, is. And I was trying to figure out um, you know, why are animals unique? How do they move? How do you study them? And what are the interactions with people? All thanks to my father, Dr. Vlaskaranth, who's a tiger biologist. So to today, I think most of us in conservation science, when you start out, you start out as a biologist, but you very clearly and quickly learn that you have to learn economics, you have to learn political science, you have to learn geography, and you have to really learn to work with a very, very wide array of scientists and uh, practitioners around the world. So today I serve as a chief conservation scientist at Center for Wildlife Studies, which is based in India, and I'm also faculty at Duke University, so that kind of keeps my, my um, uh, feet on the ground, uh, both from taking science and innovation to actual real-world practice. So the part of the planet I live in is truly extraordinary. Over thousands of years of evolution, you've had species that have moved into the Indian subcontinent. We share species like bears and wolves and foxes with North America and Europe. We share rhinos and tigers and a whole bunch of species with South and Southeast Asia. We also share lions and cheetahs and hyenas with Africa. So we are a global melting pot for wildlife, which I think most people in the world, you might celebrate Indian food, Indian culture, Indian languages. This is what I want to celebrate India for. But there's something totally unique about India. As most of you are probably aware, we have 1.4 billion people, an economy growing at 7%. And the reason why we are in red, along with Madagascar, is if you look at the numbers of unique, extraordinary species trying to coexist with wildlife, India truly is on the edge. So I feel the kind of science, the innovation, and the practice that we do today in India will actually lead uh, forward situations that will come uh, to play in other parts of the world. So I started a, my first, I would say my first five, 10 years of my career, I would very much focus on the ecology of species. I have worked on birds, amphibians, mammals, but I realized very quickly that the real challenge was on the intersection of where people and wildlife live. And we've worked on an extraordinary array of issues ranging from human-wildlife conflict to landscape connectivity to wildlife trade and hunting, wildlife tourism, and wildlife diseases. 
Today, I'm just going to talk about the very first piece, which is human-wildlife conflict. So what do I mean by conflict? It's people, it's images like this that can break your heart. It's someone who loses crops and is unable to feed their family, and in retaliation, may choose to electrocute an elephant. This is the reality of what people living next to wildlife face, not just in India, but many parts of the world. Similarly, you may have livestock that is injured or killed, and you may choose to retaliate. I wouldn't recommend doing this. <laughs> and you might even poison the livestock. And this is not very different in North America and Europe. You have wolves, you have lynxes, you have bears that show up eating garbage, running into people. And the fact is, human-wildlife conflict is here to stay. It's a major global challenge, and I think literally the intensity of what we face in India is, is what kind of leads us forward. So I spent the last 20 years studying human-wildlife conflict. We've done research all across India. We have about 100,000 incidents per year reported to the government. Our surveys on the ground in over 3,000 villages indicate that less than 30% of people are filing. So the real number is probably more, much, much higher, right? This is people losing livestock, people losing uh, crops, people losing their houses, fencing, property, and occasionally being injured and killed. And what the research established, it took seven years, about 300 citizen science volunteers going across India, is that we have very high crop damage, which is about 70, 75% of the problem. We have uh, lower instances of livestock predation, which is about 15%. And very fortunately, we only have 5% um, of, hu um, of human injury and death, which I think is really crit critical to the survival of species. So like most scientists in the room, I published and I published and I published and I published. And about eight years ago, I woke up one day and I said, I don't want to just do the science anymore. We are not changing reality on the ground. What are you doing to make a difference for these animals and for these people that you supposedly care about, right? We do care about science. I'm just going to share one paper uh, published in PNS two, two years ago. And all of the work we had done, you know, if you ask people to take a guess about looking at human injury and death, from, from India, what we realized is if you're looking at human injury, sloth bears are actually the species that you need to be really looking at. You asked people to take a wild guess, sloth bear wouldn't even show up. They would guess tiger, they would guess leopard, they would guess wolf. They would blame a whole bunch of species when the real issue is actually with sloth bears. Similarly with human death, you might, get, you might get the guess right. It's actually elephants, right? So this is what science does. It provides you really key insights. And yes, we can publish in the best journals, but what else, right? So the last, I'm very proud to say, the last eight years, we've launched five conservation programs that I'm going to walk you through that have taken the insights from research, developed methodologies, and actually made an impact on the ground. The first program, while Save, Save in my language, Kannada means to save, is a simple idea. If you live in a village and you have a conflict incident, you call a toll-free number, our staff on the ground, come there, help you file the claim with the government. We as an NGO don't disperse any funding. What we help is overcome and bridge that gap, which is take the photographs in a certain way, fill the forms. Why is this important? Because one of this came from our research that so few people were filing. They're un unable to file the claims. So how do you expect tolerance to take place and stay um, when, they're so, you know, when their own livelihoods are affected. So what it has done over the last eight years, we started in two high conflict parks. What it's done is actually build trust and community building. It's made people realize that we're not there just for the animals, that we care for people as well. We serve over 1,500 villages today in six parks, and this is slowly expanding. We're going to one park after the other. We've re gotten people a million dollars in compensation from the Indian government. And I think this is a model that can be replicated for anywhere in the world where large animals live next to people so that there is a sense of response, attribution, and claim. What we've also done is cut the processing times from six months to less than 60 days. 
If you file a claim, you don't, you don't get cash payments. You actually get paid in your bank account today. So I think there is a sea change. What it also does is give us very intense monitoring data, live data coming in every single day on the intensity of conflict that you're actually seeing. This is just data from two parks. We've continued to publish, and, and, and what so Save does is when you are able to collect data like this, you're able to identify what species are responsible, what months of the year do you have conflict, what crops are, can you attribute crop damage to, right? And this has kind of led to on-ground behavior change practices with farmers that we work with. So the next thing I kind of wanted to share with you is as we started to implement this first program, we realized that most of the kids growing up in these villages were not excited about seeing a tiger or elephant or anything else. Um, and it was time to change that. So we co-designed, Gabby Salazar and I, a conservation education program to inspire Indian children to care about their own wildlife. Not, they knew kangaroos, they knew giraffes, they knew animals found all across the world. They didn't know about lion-tailed macaques and gaur and other spectacular Indian species. What we also did is did, so the program goes to village schools. It's a four-session program now in partnership with National Geographic and delivers education in a way that's fun, exciting, not rote memorization, actually uses arts and storytelling. We've also published the idea was we adapted North American environmental education tools, and what we realized is they don't work for Indian children. The cultural context is different. Uh, on an empathy scale of 100, we found that European kids or North American kids were scoring 60. Indian kids were already at 80, 85. At the end of the program, we had pushed them up to 95. So it gives me a lot of hope that Indians are highly empathetic, and if you're going to save wildlife, this is a good foundational block. We've done, well, what have we done? Despite the pandemic, we've created educational resources in our own languages, and getting our kids and educators to uh, use tools and activities developed in our cultural context. But more importantly, we've managed to go to 700 schools, 30,000 children, and evaluate 95% of these kids to see if you implement a program, does it work, why does it work, and what can you change? Very boldly ambitious, we want to now get to 3,000 schools and half a million children in the next five years in India. The third program I want to mention is as the pandemic was break breaking in India, we realized that most adults, frontline health workers, frontline forest workers, didn't know how do you cope with conflict and disease. So we started to run these public outreach and education workshops because it wasn't just corona. We had five other zoonoses in this part of India. We had Nipah, we had uh, scrub typhus, leptospirosis, rabies, and there's very little awareness. And the transmission pathways for these diseases are truly from the parks, either people going in or eating wildlife or other forms of consumption, which really increases their exposure. Then once these diseases slip out, it's very easy for them to kind of become epidemic or pandemic status. So the idea with, with this program was first get on the ground, get across India during COVID, deliver this program in 70 parks, involve 40,000 frontline health forest department um, healthcare staff. And what I'm truly proud of is while everybody sat locked in in their houses, my team at CWS went across an entire ecological co landscape collecting data, and which we're modeling now. And I think next time uh, I get the pub, um, next time we'll have a publication showing disease risk for all of these diseases and conflict risk for an entire ecological landscape. And the last program I want to mention again comes from research. So you have conflict, you're trying to mitigate. We've done research showing solar fencing, electric fencing, ditches, none of this stuff works. Heavy investment of people's time and money, but really doesn't work. And what is the fundamental issue? You are growing crops that simply attract elephants and a lot of large herbivores. So how do you get people to change the land use living around the park? We didn't jump into the designing a program without doing the research. We had two PhD students who went out there, did choice experiments with farmers living in this entire landscape, 
asking them about their willingness to reforest a portion of their land or to try tourism. Well, the results were overwhelming. People are tired, they're fed up, they're not able to make a living from farming, and so the, what they want to do is really try to change how, uh, the, not, not just switch from agriculture to agroforestry, but really build sustainable lives and livelihoods. So we launched the latest in the wild babies programs. It's the wild carbon program. What we're doing is we're working with every smallholder farmer living next to these protected areas. They're voluntarily setting aside a portion of their land and this is where the carbon sequestration benefit comes in. We didn't start out with a focus on carbon. We started out with a focus on improving their livelihoods and, and um, creating a buffer space and mitigating conflict. But in the end, the program will also create a carbon sink. So we're, very, we're starting very small in two protected areas in, in India today, working with 10,000 farms. You have to understand the context of farming in India. People don't own thousands and thousands of acres of farms. They own a one acre to five acre piece of land. And so I think this will lay the groundwork for us to scale across very large areas. So where do we want to go? I mean, we, we throw the word sustainability around very, very lightly, very, very easily. What I think is you need to create living landscapes that make space for wildlife, that make space for people. Our goal at CWS is to work in this part of India, the Western and Eastern Ghats biodiversity hotspots. There are about 100 protected areas and 100 million people living with wildlife. I believe the solutions that we're coming up with are innovative. They use science, education, monitoring, but they also have on-ground impact. I don't do this alone. We've grown from 16 to 80 people today, and I'm continuing to grow. We're supported by an extraordinary array of academic um, partners, think tanks, governments, and, and private funding support. And I think this is a testament to the caliber of the work we're doing. And more than anything, I think, you know, we live in a very interesting time, particularly in India, post the 1950s, we've brought wildlife back. The question is, are we going to be able to hold on to the animals that we have in the next 20, 30 years as this country booms and you have to provide for 1.4 billion people or are we gonna lose the wildlife? I, I'm hoping as an optimist that we don't lose the wildlife. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it is very eye-opening. And I'm very happy to see that you have so many partners supporting the project as well. Thanks. We're going to hear now the presentation from Professor Thomas Leon. And it's going to be towards corporate sustainability, transparency, accountability, and responsibility. Uh, you can start now. Thank, Thank you very, you very much, much to the MDPI, MDPI Foundation. Foundation. I'm, truly I'm truly honored, honored to be part, part of this, of this uh, award, award ceremony today. today. Especially, Especially in light, in light of, the of the series of previous, of previous winners, winners who uh, set, set a very uh, high bar for the rest of us. I want to switch topics and talk about moving the business world toward a more sustainable footing. And I want to emphasize three things, transparency, accountability, and responsibility. I want to start as a reference point with a quote many of you will be familiar with. It's old now. It's 50 years old from Milton Friedman saying that there is one and only one social responsibility of business, and that is to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game. Well, from that perspective, there's no point of doing corporate sustainability. Companies simply follow the laws, comply with environmental regulations, and that's the end of the story. And corporate sustainability is actually part of an ongoing battle over the issue of shareholder primacy versus stakeholder capitalism. And I think it's a front on which we're making a lot of progress. I wanna immediately share with you two institutions that are really leading the way in this front. One is the Frederick A. and Barbara M. Erb Institute at University of Michigan, where I work and where I'm the faculty director. This is a very unusual partnership between the School for Environment and Sustainability here at University of Michigan and the Ross School of Business. We've been around for 26 years now, so we were very early on 
in this game and we're the biggest business sustainability institute at any university in the world. We do a variety of things that you would expect institutes to do. We feature teaching and learning, our dual degree program where students get an MBA degree and an MS, a Master of Science in Sustainability, is our flagship program, but we also have programs for undergraduates and executives at this point. In addition, we do business engagement. I'm gonna to talk to you about our Corporate Political Responsibility Task Force in a couple of minutes, and we do scholarly and applied research. So I'm very grateful to the Herb Institute for making my research possible. I also wanna share another institution, the Alliance for Research on Corporate Sustainability, a partnership amongst 27 business schools around the world devoted to advancing rigorous academic research on corporate sustainability issues and bringing young scholars into the business school community so that we can change the old fashioned Milton Friedman dictum and take a more forward looking perspective. We host an annual conference last year. It was in uh, Milan at Bacona University. Uh, this past year, we were at UVA uh, in Washington, DC. And I'll mention this group again as we go along. I wanna share three books in some sense that I've written over the years, which give me a framework for talking about this whole issue of corporate sustainability. And I'll talk about each one in more detail in a few minutes. And I wanna frame all of this in the context of something that's often called the issue life cycle. So issues could be sustainability of sanitation, it could be conservation of biodiversity and wildlife. Over time, these issues tend to develop and as they do, they have greater impact on business. The first stage, of course, is to recognize that an issue exists. But that alone accomplishes little unless there are interest groups that mobilize around the issue to create change. And then a very important step may happen, which is that new laws may be enacted that drive change. That's not the end of the story, of course. Even after laws are passed, we need regulations that implement them and enforcement processes to ensure that they actually are complied with. And the old school story, the Milton Friedman story, was looking only at the back end of this issue life cycle. How do regulations affect business behavior? What are the rules of the game within which companies have to work? That's a very limited perspective. And I'll say that for me, the thing that really started to change that perspective was a day when I was sitting in the office and my colleague, John Maxwell, walked down the hall and asked me a seemingly odd question. Have you read the latest Federal Reserve newsletter? No, I had not. Why was that interesting? Because it featured a story about this group, the Council of Great Lakes Industries, and it said they were going beyond compliance with the law to reduce pollution beyond what they had to. And this seemed very odd to people schooled in a Milton Friedman perspective that said, all you have to do is stay within the rules. And I include a photo here of Catherine Buckner, who's the president of CJLI, partly because she's a graduate of our HERB dual degree program and just an illustration of the kind of impact our grads are having out there. So this raised this interesting question, why would companies go beyond compliance with the law? And we thought about this for a long time, and we came up with a fairly simple answer to preempt even tougher laws from emerging. There may be other reasons as well, but this is certainly one important one. And after thinking about this for a number of years, John and I wrote a book that laid out several ways in which corporate sustainability issues could influence the public policy system. So one step could be to preempt the emergence of new laws. Even if that's impossible, corporate sustainability could influence the regulations that are forthcoming, or it could deflect enforcement of those regulations towards other companies rather than yourself. Now, the thing that seemed important from that was not just that they might preempt regulatory threats, but this might actually be good for society. It might save on regulatory costs and allow us to move faster and get more done if a couple of things were true. One, the company is accountable. That is, it follows through on its commitments to stakeholders, 
And two, the company is transparent so that stakeholders can monitor its actions. And those two things turn out to be very important. But we also showed that it can be bad for society if what the company is doing is to weaken public policy relative to what it would be otherwise. That's a theme that I'll return to in a little while. Now, one thing that's happened in the U.S., especially, is that it's increasingly hard to get anything done politically. We're stuck in a world of political gridlock. That changes the story I was just telling you, because in that story, there's a threat of future public policies and regulations that motivates companies to move forward. Suppose that's not true. So suppose gridlock blocks regulatory threats. Now we're not getting to the last part of the issue life cycle at all. And we're forced to focus on the front end of the story, asking can non-governmental organizations drive change through private politics, direct engagement with companies, rather than working through the legislative and regulatory process. My second book called Good Cop, Bad Cop was all about how environmental NGOs work to try to achieve these goals. And I called it Good Cop, Bad Cop because there are some environmental organizations, like you see on the left here, um, exemplified by the Environmental Defense Fund, that work with business. They may wear suits. They may go to office buildings in New York and sit down to negotiate solutions. That's not enough, though. We also need the so-called bad cops, the folks that are willing to make good trouble, that are willing to protest and boycott and stir up a demand for change. And part of the lesson of that book was that we need both of these types of groups and they work together to create change. So lessons from that stage of research were first that this combination is crucial. And second, that often the solution that NGOs can provide involves creating new standards and certifications that companies can adhere to. And those assure these two factors that I mentioned before, accountability and transparency. What we've also learned is that this approach can move companies forward and can get individual companies to improve their behavior, but it doesn't create systemic change to solve really large, wicked problems that are global in nature. And of course, we're very well aware, especially after this year of extreme heat, the hottest year on record in human history, we're told, that the planet is burning up. And so these incrementalist measures are not sufficient. We need to take actions that will lead to systemic change if we want to try to solve the truly wicked problems. Why do we have trouble doing that? One reason is a massive flood of greenwashing. This is attempts by corporations to paint themselves as greener than they really are. Now, I haven't written a book on this topic yet, although that's planned for next year's sabbatical, but I have written a whole series of papers about greenwashing with my colleague, John Maxwell, with my colleague, Dr. Ren Montgomery at the Ivy School of Business in Canada, and with former doctoral student, Oh Hee Kim, and I'll share with you just one chart from Dr. Montgomery in my most recent paper. This is a trend looking at articles on greenwashing in major news media over the last 20 years. You can see there was a big spike in 2008, 2009, and then a sharp decline. And we had reason to think this was good news, that maybe we were stemming the tide of greenwashing. But what you see at the end of the chart, of course, is a massive spike over the last several years. And that's been driven by, we believe, two main things. First of all, corporate ESG investing efforts that many people see as greenwashing. And secondly, corporate decarbonization or net zero commitments that are also often viewed as greenwashing. So the problem has not gone away. And when it comes to climate change in particular, it's a very serious thing standing in the way of systemic change. Perhaps the most pernicious form of this type of greenwashing is when companies pose as champions of the environment and then 
lobby behind closed doors to block any kind of legislative and regulatory process progress towards solving our real problems. So that led back to ARCS, the Alliance for Research on Corporate Sustainability. A group of us were starting to realize that this was the central problem several years ago, and we organized a retreat to try to discuss when companies can help to lead systemic change. We spent several days working on the question and came out with a very disappointing answer. There was very little evidence to show that companies ever lead systemic change. However, there was plenty of evidence that companies often block systemic change through the use of lobbying and other forms of political influence. So we came out of that retreat in a place we really didn't expect. And we wrote a paper together, 13 people writing a paper, don't do it at home, this is dangerous. But it ended up well in the end. We wrote a paper called CSR Needs CPR, Corporate Sustainability and Politics. And there was a double entendre that was very much intended. Corporate social responsibility, we argued, is not enough. It also needs resuscitation in the form of corporate political responsibility. That paper won an award as best paper in the journal California Management Review in 2019. It also fed back to the Herb Institute because at the Herb Institute, we took this very seriously and we've created a corporate responsibility task force designed to try to diffuse this idea out in the public sphere. So we're doing this in two ways. We work with members of the task force, individual companies, to help them align their political influence with their values, their commitments to stakeholders and their purpose. Secondly, and more importantly, we're aiming to create a new norm of corporate political responsibility across the entire private sector by bringing awareness, capacity, and commitment to this issue. The vision for the framework goes back to those three words that I emphasized at the very beginning, transparency, in this case, about your political activities with regard to your stakeholders and the public. Secondly, accountability. That means aligning corporate commitments with stated purpose values and their existing commitments to other stakeholders. And finally, responsibility, that companies step up to support the systems, the underlying systems, such as our previous two speakers have been talking about, on which markets, society, and life itself depend. That's the heart of the framework. The work product from our task force in this first year was to create a set of principles for corporate political responsibility that take those three and add to it one additional one, legitimacy. So does the company have a legitimate and authentic basis for engaging in political influence at all? We issued those principles in Washington, D.C. last March. And we've received a lot of public attention, very positive attention for it. You can see down at the bottom of the screen our group of five inaugural corporate supporters of these principles. So these are companies that have stood up publicly for them. First is DSM, a former mining company, now a nutritional products company. Aspen Snowmass, the skiing company. IBM, I assume everybody's heard of IBM. Corelli, the tire company, and Danone, North America. So we're proud of those companies, proud to be working with them. These have led to my most recent book, which will be coming out in November, about corporate political responsibility. And it's focusing our attention now on the question of what's the role of business in either creating gridlock or breaking through gridlock. And we aim, of course, to create that second one. And we hope, going back to Milton Friedman, that perhaps CPR can be a common ground that helps reduce polarization in society between people that believe the only purpose of a company is to make profits and other folks, such as the Business Roundtable now, which includes a group of the world's uh, most influential CEOs who claim that they have a commitment to all stakeholders. And our perspective is that the way these two things come together is that businesses influence civic and political processes. And if we can 
establish some agreement around what's the legitimate role of business in influencing civic and political processes, we can move toward greater sustainability and maybe create the systemic change that we know is so badly needed. So just to summarize, corporate sustainability efforts can certainly advance progress, but they also run the risk of undermining support for needed public policies, which are essential if we want systemic change. And this is especially a problem because greenwash is ever present and corporate lobbying often blocks policy adoption which is why CSR needs corporate political responsibility. Companies that claim to be sustainability leaders need to actively advocate for the policies that we need. And the keys to those things are the three things I've emphasized before, transparency, accountability, and responsibility. And in closing, I just want to reiterate my great appreciation for the University of Michigan, the Herb Institute that I'm privileged to lead here, and the Alliance for Research on Corporate Sustainability, which is helping to diffuse these ideas out much more broadly. Thank you very much. Okay, so if I pass the Marco Templeton to uh, take the stage, and I also would like to give you the uh, award. Oh. Not the, yeah, okay. <laughs> the other one. Yeah, welcome. Thanks very much. So first of all, thanks very much to the MDPI Sustainability Foundation for the award. Um, and I'd also like to thank them on behalf of the whole sanitation research and practitioner community, because I think the award is also a recognition of the importance of the topic of sanitation still in, as a sustainable development goal. Um, I'd also like to congratulate the other awardees and the speakers for the amazing work that they're doing and the contributions that they're making in other aspects of sustainability. It's really amazing. I feel much more optimistic about the world than I did uh, at the beginning of the day. So thanks very much for your wonderful hard work. And I hope you'll feel optimistic after my talk also. So I'm an engineer uh, based in the UK at Imperial College uh, London. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the, the ongoing challenge of the fact that uh, so many billion people in the world still lack access to what we call safely managed sanitation, which is basically um, a toilet where the, the waste is uh, isolated safely uh, or it's able to be removed safely and treated off-site somewhere safely. Um, and it can't be a shared facility either. So unfortunately, many people uh, in the world either don't have any kind of toilet, or if they do have a toilet, it's one that might look like this. It's, it's filled up, it's quite dirty, it's actually a, probably a focal point of disease in many cases. So it's something that was installed with good intentions, but ends up being a, a huge problem. And unfortunately, the rate of progress towards improving sanitation has been very slow. And we really need to quadruple the rate of progress to reach SDG 6, which is the, the goal for clean water and sanitation by 2030. And sanitation is not just a goal in, its, in itself. It has a number of uh, wider benefits, which I'll be talking about later on in the presentation. Uh, and if we try to sort of monetize all of these benefits, it, it, it turns out that the benefit to cost ratio of implementing safely managed sanitation is somewhere between about 2.2 and 2.9. So it's not only a case of having impacts on health and social, and social development, but also huge economic uh, development issues by not improving sanitation. So this is the system that we need to make work more sustainably, okay? Um, it's, it's not feasible, uh, or, or you could argue not sustainable, that everybody in the world will someday be hooked up to a, a sewer system with water flowing through it, um, like, like we have in some parts of the world. So really, you're talking about making what's called non-sewered sanitation work for, for people around the world. And it's, it's really an engineering system, but there are a lot of interdisciplinary um, inputs that are required to make each part of this system work. And in different parts of the world, basically, different parts of this system are not, are not functioning. So the system is not sustainable currently. Either you have people who have toilets, uh, but they're not you know, they're full, so there isn't a way to empty them properly. Or if there is an emptying service in many parts of the world, that emptying is not able to be done safely. So it's also an issue there about dignity and, 
and uh, you know, um, respect for the people who have to actually do this terrible job around the world of un unsafely emptying latrines. And then even if you do have somebody who can empty your toilet, they might not always have somewhere safe to dispose of the waste. So quite often the, the, the waste just be, ends up being reintroduced into the environment, which sort of negates the purpose of having a toilet in the first place uh, if, you're, if you're then going to be spreading that waste back into the environment. So this is a system that is, is failing currently, which if, if we could make it work in a sustainable way, uh, would have you know, massive impacts for, for SDG 6. And when I speak to communities uh, around the world uh, who are on this, this uh, journey of sort of making this system work, there's a number of questions that you have to ask them about different, different parts of the, of the system, uh, depending on where they are currently on, on, the, on the management system of, of waste. And you can see not all of these questions are actually engineering questions. Most of them are not engineering questions, actually. So for example, asking people, how, are, how is this going to be financed? How many users are, going to, are, they, are there going to be? Who, who, how much um, income is, is available to, to support this system? Uh, who's actually going to clean and maintain it? You know, there are a lot of questions around economics, governance, uh, management, um, behavior, education here, which are not really engineering challenges. But as an engineer, I, I always emphasize that sanitation does still have some significant engineering challenges that we need to, to solve also. And so one innovation case study that I'll talk about is a project that I was involved in, uh, funded through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, they had a reinvent the toilet challenge. And we came up with a, a, a technology which we called the tiger toilet. It's not a toilet for tigers, I should say for uh, the previous speaker. It's, uh, it's a, it's a toilet that uses tiger worms, which are uh, basically a ubiquitous type of worm around the world. They're composting worms. They're, extreme, they're like nature's rubbish men, so they're extremely efficient at degrading most forms of organic waste and transforming it into a very sterile compost material. And they emit CO2 as they do so, but it means that the waste doesn't emit methane. So we think there's also a lot of greenhouse gas reduction, or greenhouse uh, warming, you know, uh, uh, warming potential reduction by substituting the CO2 for CH4. Going back to what we heard earlier this morning about biogenic uh, emissions from the keynote speaker this morning. Um, so the idea here was to adapt a very basic latrine design, keep the cost the same or, or ideally lower than the current technologies available, and hopefully by doing so and incorporating the worms there underneath the toilet, you're reducing filling rates, you're having fewer smells because the worms are degrading the waste very efficiently and quickly. And also when you do have to empty the latrine, it's a much easier process because you have this, this clean compost material instead of raw waste to empty. And so it was a really great um, interdisciplinary project. We had design engineers, we had sort of more traditional civil engineers like, like myself, but also um, we went out and spoke to the intended end users and, and got their feedback in terms of, is this a technology that would, would interest you? What would be your concerns with this technology? Um, and basically, it, it worked really well. So these, these tiger worms can reduce the filling rate by at least half or maybe up to two thirds compared to a normal latrine. And we implemented this concept, which, which I've sort of called eye to eye, which is taking something from an initial idea and then actually having impact at, um, on the ground at scale. And I think to, to address a lot of sustainable development challenges, we need to be better at, at scaling up good ideas. There's, there's a lot of great ideas out there, not, not just technological ones, but, but also it could be in terms of systems or, or processes. But we need to have a more systematic way of, of getting these out and, and into, into practice. So in, in the case of the tiger worm toilet, we had this idea generation initially with partners and stakeholders then you have to do some hard science under controlled conditions, but then once you're, you're fairly confident that the idea works, it's about engaging with users. In this case, it was in, in India. And, and as I said in the box on the right there, quite a lot of academic research sort of stops at that point of proving concepts, but then not really thinking about what are the challenges to scaling the technology. And in stage two then, it was about finding entrepreneurs who were already building other types of sanitation project, uh, products and getting them to help us to make it um, you know, a, a viable business model. Um, and then once those technologies are being deployed in the field, it's, it's also an, another uh, step in the research, which is, which is interesting, is to look at what's the feedback we're getting from users and should we then adapt the technology to make it even more sustainable. So this is the initial experimentation. Uh, pretty simple diagram there. We had sort of an input of waste 
and we had uh, one experimental setup without the worms and one with the worms, and we were able to test, you know, what's the biomass of worms that you need, what are the different layers, um, bedding, bedding layers that you need to support the worm population, what, what should be the loading rates of, of waste onto the toilet, and also able to measure how clean is the waste um, after it's treated. Uh, and we started with some, some nice prototypes in, in, uh, in Wales, in, in the UK, uh, to, to actually test it with, with you know, many users. Uh, but as this was going on, we were also out uh, in Pune in India and talking to a lot of uh, intended end users, looking at are the local materials available, how would the design be adapted to, to what families there want uh, and can afford. Um, and then uh, the idea worked so well in India that then a lot of international agencies picked up the idea and they developed standardized designs for, for these tiger room toilets. So Oxfam, which who some of you might know is a large uh, humanitarian organization, they've published a design manual which is not proprietary, there's no IP or anything associated with it, and people have adapted this design uh, to their local contexts. But basically it's, it's normally something like this, where you have a squat pan, uh, flushing water, you know, it, it'd be a poor flush uh, toilet, uh, and instead of just going into a pit or, or directly uh, out into the environment, it goes through this, this container that has the tiger worms, which, to, which transform the waste into compost. Um, and then once these things are out in the field, as I said, it, it sort of leads into another, another period of research where you can then send you know, students out into the field and actually do some research to see how they're working out there. And as engineers, we like to do uh, very nerdy things like uh, you know, complex modeling of how these very basic systems are working. But uh, we, you know, we've done that to really get a really good idea of estimating how quickly these toilets fill up um, to prove the point. And I also had one student who put some, of course, with the consent of the, the users, uh, put some, some red light cameras into some of the toilets to actually show that even after many years of operation, the, worms, the worm population is still healthy and it's still degrading the waste uh, without any kind of intervention required from the, uh, from the users. Um, and so with that technology, that's been going for about uh, 12, 13 years now. And now, I'm, as I said, I'm really at the, the stage where I'm trying to find ways to scale this up to get more, more and more people to, to benefit from the technology. No technology is a silver bullet and is appropriate in every condition, but there are enough people around the world who have tried it now and had developed good practice, that um, I created this association which allows people to share good practice, say what, what, where it doesn't work, where it does work, and, and identify also research questions to, to help make it even better. So if you're interested, um, it's not a very catchy name, but IWBSA.org uh, is the, the short form. And interestingly, uh, we, we were initially thinking of this as a technology for households, but actually now it's been scaled up and is even being used for community scale waste treatment. So this is a neat treatment plant I visited in Rwanda back in March of this year. And um, the picture in the middle there shows an entire treatment plant which treats the waste for, I, th I think, 65,000 households. And basically trucks bring the waste that's been emptied from pit latrines up to a, a holding tank at the top of the hill, and it flows by gravity down through a number of these worm filters, which transform the waste into compost. And so what you're left at the end with is compost and clean effluent water, um, and it's all done by gravity flow, so there's no chemical or energy input required for that plant. So I think it's, uh, it was an idea that started you know, with us thinking about households, but it's something that can be applied on much larger scales also. So today, we know that these are, these are being applied in at least nine different countries. There's about 200,000 people at least who have the Tiger Room toilet in their, in their home. Uh, 57 tons of waste per day being treated. And some economic estimates have been done by organizations like Oxfam who say that probably over, if you look at a five-year comparison with a traditional basic pit latrine, it's about a 90% lower maintenance cost because you end up not having to empty the latrine. So uh, so frequently. Um, so a lot of the other speakers have done a good job of saying what's their next steps in their research, so I thought I'd have a couple slides on that too. And I recently um, got a research chair funded through the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK uh, in partnership, again, with Oxfam and also Water for People, an American nonprofit organization. 
Um, and here we're going to be looking at, again, technological innovation at different parts of this fecal sludge management chain, uh, and, and applying some of the same approaches, hopefully, that we use to develop the tiger worm toilet to, to solving some other problems along this, this management chain. And then lastly, I thought I'd just finish by, by talking a bit about how um, these goals are linked, which we've heard a lot about already today. But quite often when I talk to um, engineering students, I emphasize that when you're building a technology, you're not just, you know, we're not just doing this for the sake of sanitation. It actually has much broader um, societal benefits. And the SDGs are indeed linked. So um, if, you put a, if you put a toilet into schools, for example, uh, that's going to impact uh, good health and well-being, quality education. It might mean that, um, that girls are able to go to school uh, you know, um, uh, if, if the sanitary conditions are improved uh, for them there. So a lot of knock-on benefits. And this, this picture particularly struck me, which was taken by my PhD student, Laura Braun, when she was in Ethiopia. And she showed this picture, and I, I would have guessed, how old would you think that little girl is in the middle of the picture? I, I would have guessed she was maybe six or seven. I think she's actually 12 or 13 because she has stunting and anemia, because the, basically the toilets are so terrible in the schools, and a lot of the kids there have a number of worm-based diseases, which, which you know, sap all the nutrients and, and mean that you don't, you don't uh, grow, and it also it affects learning. Um, so it has generational knock-on effects, really, by not um, addressing this issue. And one particular uh, health issue that I've been studying quite a lot is, is this disease called schistosomiasis which is a mouthful, but it's also called Bilharzia. And it's, it's, a, it's an ancient problem, I say here, because uh, people have found mummies, going back to the ancient Egyptians, uh, and they found the eggs of the worms in the ancient Egyptians. So it was def it's definitely been around for thousands of years. And there's a new film about Napoleon out now. Um, and when Napoleon's army invented, invaded Egypt in the 1800s, a lot of them got schistosomiasis also. And it's a, it's, a, it's a really, in development, we call it a, a wicked problem. It's something that has been around for thousands of years, and it's not, there's no one easy solution. And it, the reason it's a big problem is that uh, the way that the life cycle works is that an infected person sheds the, uh, par the form of the parasite in their urine or their feces, and if that then goes into water where there's a particular type of snail, the snail gets infected, and the snail then sheds more of the parasite into the water, and you, you are, are, are infected by the disease by coming in contact with this parasite, not by drinking it, but even by just standing in the water, it bores through your skin and can give you this disease. So the World Health Organization now says, we want to finally eliminate this disease. We want to solve this wicked problem. And they've mainly been doing it by giving people drugs on the bottom right here. Um, and to their credit, a lot of the drugs have been donated for free, so it's, it's, not, it's not even a, an economic problem. But what they're finding is that a lot of people get reinfected if, if their water and sanitation conditions are not very good, because these drugs are not uh, vaccines, they're, they're just deworming drugs. So uh, in some ways, it must be quite frustrating for the pharmaceutical companies to be giving these huge donations of drugs, and then going back nine months later and finding that the disease is still there. So um, the research that we've done is really to highlight Sure, water and sanitation is more expensive than free drugs, uh, but is it a more sustainable solution to solving the schistosomiasis problem? So I was involved in a, a problem. Uh, well, first of all, we did some systematic reviews to estimate, to look at um, all of the studies that have been done on the relationship between water and sanitation and schistosomiasis. And we basically found there was a lot of confounding factors in those earlier studies. Um, a lot of them were done by medics, not by engineers, so they didn't always describe uh, the quality of the toilets that people had, for example, or the status of the toilets. Um, so we, we then were involved in a, a national mapping project in Ethiopia, where we uh, went into over 1,600 schools, and we had health partners who were measuring, uh, for example, infection with some of these worms in 80,000 children. And at the same time, my team was going around, and we were uh, quantifying what's the status of the wash facilities in these schools, so the water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities. And that allowed us to then do some statistical comparisons to say, you know, is there actually a positive benefit of having these wash facilities upgraded in schools to prevent this disease? And 
as we were hoping and, and uh, as you'd expect, there, there was a strong association between schistosomiasis and especially contact with contaminated water in schools and also other types of infections with, with poor quality toilets. And, and that really actually did help to shape the Ethiopian government's thinking in terms of how do we invest sustainably, what are the, the most beneficial long-term investments that we can make to, to really have an impact on some of these diseases. Um, and there's some further research that we did, another website that you could check out if you're interested called the Wiser, the Wiser Project, was looking at how can you make water safe from that particular parasite. So what are the chlorine doses? How do you design a sand filter properly to make the water safe if, if you're living in these endemic communities? And it was a great project, very interdisciplinary again, snail experts, engineers, behavior change people, um, and uh, across Ethiopia and Tanzania. So in case you, you drifted off, here are my five uh, take-home messages from my lecture today. So, you know, I think we're all aware of the fact that sanitation is a huge global problem still, and we need to keep working on it. It's, it's maybe not the most sexy topic. It comes in and out of, of vogue sometimes, uh, but it's a huge challenge, and I think it's one of the biggest development challenges that still exists. Um, innovation is needed to solve technical problems, but also interdisciplinary coll collaboration is needed to really make these sustainable. Uh, it's important to always involve community members in sanitation planning. It's not about engineers going in and saying, here's how you solve the problem. It's about hear co-designing, hear hearing what are their preferences and ideas. Good ideas need to be scaled up, and progress is possible. So that's my optimistic message to end the, the lecture. And, and that ultimately, sustainable sanitation, it's not just about giving people toilets. It's actually ultimately about improved health, quality of life, not just for the current generation, but also into future generations. You know, if, if you're looking at, for example, targeting uh, uh, improving quality of life for kids, for example. So it's, worth, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile investment. Some huge thank yous. So again, I'd like to thank the MDPI Sustainability Foundation, uh, the funders of my work over the years, uh, my brilliant collaborators uh, in about 15 different countries that I've worked in my career. And uh, no academic can do work without uh, brilliant students and research team, a couple of whom are sitting here in the, in the room, or three <laughs> alumnus. <laughs> and so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I hope that's an optimistic message for you today. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, does anyone have any question to make it now? Or, yeah, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, you can also ask uh, uh, everyone in, in, uh, during the aperol. Okay. Ah, I have to give yeah. it to you. Sorry, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Ah, okay, you can keep two then. <laughs> uh, hi, so thank you very much. Uh, this was super interesting. Um, again, a food for thought opens a whole new world of preoccupation, but also hope. Um, one thing that I was thinking about right now, and it's literally pretty much out of context of very specific research that you're doing and actually practical work, but when implementing these nature-based solutions, right, mm -hmm. um, what I'm always a little bit afraid of, and being ignorant, I'm not a, an expert in the field, being a bit ignorant in the sense of, okay, fine, we're using the worms now mm -hmm. to solve our problem. What if those get out of control? <laughs> Um, in yep. the sense of, you can't contain all of them, yep. there is, okay, this, this way of, okay, we have them in there, they're doing their work, yep. what if they start doing their work outside? So uh, once you touch the, the delicate, um, ecosystem. the balance, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and, and the so many unknowns that we have in an ecosystem, do, do you have a backup plan, <laughs> basically? <laughs> That's a question that I get a lot, actually. But so, so two things to say. One is the worms we use are always local worms, so they were there anyways. It's not about introducing species from other countries or other parts of the world or anything. So second thing to say is that worms tend to stay where their food source is based on our experience, so they don't, they don't just sort of leave and go somewhere else. But I think those two things are quite reassuring, that we're not actually introducing a for, uh, an invasive species. These are worms that are already in the soil anyways. So. Thank you very much. Okay. We have some uh, good news. Already know who the uh, winners of the uh, Emerging Sustainability Leader Award are. I'm going to present them to you now. So let me start with third place, which is Dr. Bacharet Karamzad. Thank, uh, congratulations. I don't know. Show this to the camera. Congratulations. Thank you. And then. <laughs> And 
And then second place is Dr. Uh, Julia Lohmann. Congratulations. <laughs> and I'm going to invite for first place Dr. Eugene Kim. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much.